What is going on, everyone? Welcome to the Bats Cave. This is episode number eight. This is the weekly pop culture podcast where I, your host, Alex Bats, talk about everything in the world of comics, movies, video games, TV shows, all of that fantastic stuff and more. Um, yeah, so just getting like into it. This is uh, the second episode in my like Star Wars rewatch uh, things. Uh, it's actually really interesting because I had my episode go up last Wednesday and it's Friday now that I'm recording this, uh, which I don't normally record on Fridays. So normally I would have had an episode go up two days ago on the Wednesday that just passed. Um, but because of the way that I did the rewatch and timed my, the release of episodes, I just didn't think far enough ahead. And I literally didn't have space on the calendar to do, because I wanted to do an episode on the prequels, an episode on Solo and Rogue One, which is what this one is we'll get into and then an episode on the original trilogy and then an episode on um seven and eight uh before the rise of skywalker comes out and there just was not enough wednesdays on the calendar left whenever i started posting like whenever i posted the prequel episode i realized afterwards that there just wasn't enough space so i went and i skipped um having an episode go up this past wednesday and instead i'm recording tonight for this episode to go up on saturday which is the solo and rogue one episode and then I'll be recording tomorrow. I'll talk about the original trilogy, which I'm actually not even through rewatching yet. I'll finish rewatching that tonight slash tomorrow early in the like either morning or afternoon. And then I'll record the original trilogy episode Saturday night, and that will go up on Sunday. So instead of just one episode on Wednesday this week, I'm doing two episodes on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, which I think is pretty cool. I'm actually pretty hyped about that. Um, so yeah, just tons of Star Wars. I'm in such a Star Wars mood lately. I've also... Um, I just, this past week, it was probably like Tuesday or so, I think. Oh, also, before, if you're watching the video podcast, you can see on my hoodie, uh, it's really cool. It's got this lightsaber pattern on the inside of the hood. It's also like that, I can't I can't pull it up all the way, but on like the bottom half of the hoodie, where like the pocket, the front pocket is, like just all the way around from there, it's got the lightsaber pattern too, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, no, probably, uh, I think it was it was either Monday or Tuesday this week. I finished um, listening to the Darth Bane trilogy again, which those books are fantastic. Highly recommend if you haven't read or listened to them. Um, I think I feel like I've mentioned it on this podcast before, but I listen to audiobooks a lot. It's the main way that I actually consume like novels and stuff. Because um, I, lo- I love like actually sitting down and physically reading books. I just don't really have the time to. Like the books that I do sit down and actually read are comic books mostly. Um, And so I don't really have the time to just sit down like with a novel and like go through a novel, which sucks because I I really do love doing that. Um, But so for the past couple of years now, uh, I've been using Audible, which is a fan. They don't sponsor me. If they want to, that'd be great. I'm a huge fan. I I have like 30 day, like 30 days listened on Audible, which is ridiculous. Um, But yeah, I just love listening to audiobooks because with my job, I'm able to listen to them while I work a lot of the time. And so, uh, one, it makes work go by way faster. And then two, uh, it's just a very, like I'm already, it's just a better use of that time as well. Like, uh, just getting to go through books. So yeah, I've, that's actually how I read doing air quotes, uh, this series the first time I listened to it. And then, uh, yeah, I just finished listening to it for the second time, uh, earlier this week. It's fantastic. All of the star Wars books really, or at least I assume all of the star Wars books, all the star Wars books that I have listened to the production value on the audiobooks is insane it's um because they literally have like sound effects like you'll get like blaster shots lightsabers like humming and like igniting and going out you'll get like footsteps if someone's like walking down a hall you'll get like screams you get they they incorporate john williams score like in it too like it's just a it's a big production and it's just really really cool it just makes the experience like all the better um, which like, I don't have a problem with audiobooks that don't have that because most of the audiobooks I read don't have that kind of like production value. Uh, only really the Star Wars books do. Uh, but it's just really cool. It adds another like layer of atmosphere to it and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I definitely like recommend that if that's something that you may be interested in. Um, also Audible, please sponsor me. That'd be great. Um, but yeah, so I finished listening to those and then, uh, yeah, I watched, 
uh, finished rewatching Solo and Rogue One this past weekend. So that's what I'm going to be talking about for this episode. Uh, I said this at the beginning of the prequel one that I thought that episode was going to be a bit shorter and it ended up being like right under an hour. Um, I have no idea how long this one's going to be. I, it could be shorter, but then I could also possibly ramble about Rogue One for like 50 minutes. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, first, so the other thing, I'm, I'm rewatching the films in chronological order. I'm doing one, two, three, solo, Rogue One, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, because I feel like that's the best way to watch them. Sorry. My friend Sean actually told me, like, yesterday about, like, the machete order, which I never heard of before. This was before, like, all the Disney stuff came out. And it was going, like, four, five, one, two, three, six. And, like, oh, that's disgusting to me. I do not like that at all. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm rewatching them in chronological order. So I got through Solo and Rogue One this past weekend. And I love these movies. I've, I mean, admittedly have loved all of the Disney Star Wars movies that have come out. Um, but yeah, starting with Solo. So, so Solo is really interesting to me because, um, oh, here's my, I might as well like throw them out there. I've got some pretty uh, big hot takes when it comes to Han Solo in like Star Wars. Um, I've never been a fan of Han Solo at all easily my least favorite character in the original trilogy uh not really a big harrison ford fan in general don't like his han solo at all didn't care about him um just was not a fan in general i just don't like harrison's han solo and so whenever this movie was first announced um i will admit i was pretty against it i was like i think that there are a lot of other things that this money and effort could be spent towards um that are more worthwhile than exploring a like origin film for han solo um which like i hate using the thing like no one asked for it because like m most people don't ask for what ends up being their favorite like work of art um you normally don't know what you want in that regard um but i was just like there's just so many other stories and other things that i could think of uh, especially at the time that I was like, why aren't we seeing this or exploring this instead of like a Han Solo movie? Um, and so, yeah, I was pretty against it. And then the production on this film was just ridiculous. Just the amount of turbulence and um, like the reshoots and just the mess that it apparently was behind the scenes for a while. Um, but then the movie came out and I honestly really love it like a lot. I think it's great. Uh, I think it uh, really it's it shows a really cool. It's nice seeing, like, the underbelly and, like, the underworld of Star Wars. It's really cool seeing, like, the smugglers and how all of that goes and just, like, life disconnected from, like, the, the Jedi and the Sith and, like, all like the Force and everything. Like, it's just really cool to see that aspect of Star Wars explored more. Um, I really like that. And then also uh, Alden, I don't remember slash don't know how to say his last name. Um, I love his Han Solo a lot. Like, he made me care about Han Solo, um, which I wasn't really expecting. Um, but, yeah, like, I like his version of Han Solo. Um, so, like, that's that's really cool. I enjoy watching him on screen. I think that he's great. Uh, and then also, uh, Amelia Clark as Kira. Whew. Oh, okay. One, I'm a huge, huge Amelia Clark fanboy. No, I can't even lie there. I love Amelia Clark so much. Um, she is my queen. But... Um, so just her and anything is just automatic bonus points for me. But she does a really, really great job in this movie, too. She gives a great performance as Kira. Uh, I like Han and Kira more than I do Han and Leia. Just going to say that also. It's another one of my Star Wars Han Solo related hot takes. Um, and so, yeah, I really like seeing like their chemistry, I think, is really good, especially at the beginning. Um, seeing their like interplay throughout the movie because obviously their positions change drastically as the movie progresses. <clears throat> um, so like that was really cool. Um, I really love the sequence. I'm not going to go through. So for like the prequels, I went through and like broke down the movies kind of like I went, they were a little bit fresher in my mind too. Cause it's been almost a week now since I saw solo and rogue one again. Um, I I'm, so I went like scene by scene kind of with the prequels. I'm not going to do that with solo. I might do it with rogue one. I don't know. We'll see, but, um, I'm just going to kind of like give overall thoughts more so on them. Um, and so, but yeah, I really liked the, the once I'm so scatterbrained right now, but that's okay. That's what this podcast is about, which is rolling with it. Um, I really liked the scene in it's towards the beginning of solo. It's after he gets off of Corellia and he joins the empire and he's just in like just a regular, like infantry, like 
um, I don't know what it would be called. These troops that, that I don't know if that's accurate for like a group of them though, but he's, a, he's with the infantry and like, he's just on the front lines of a battle, basically like a, just a war. Um, and I think that that's really cool. Like I love seeing the war part of star Wars. And that's something that I think, especially in this scene in solo and then rogue one as a whole does really, really well um is exploring that aspect and then it's also really cool seeing just the complete um control the empire has on the galaxy just like the presence that the empire has because i mean you feel it in the original trilogy to an extent but like you don't really see how it affects day-to-day -day life as much um from what i remember in a new hope you kind of do on like tatooine and stuff whenever the empire is looking for luke and the droids and, and whatnot um you definitely see it there but I don't know. I, I think that Solo and Rogue One do a really, really good job of showing the Empire just being completely um, in control of the galaxy, really. Like, it, this is an empirical rule. Um, and so I think that's really cool to see. Not cool, but it's n not nice either. But you know what I mean. I like seeing that. Uh, it's a very interesting thing to explore and really show. And I think that these movies do that well. Um, so that's really cool. Um yeah, the action in it is fantastic. That train sequence and like it's towards the middle, beginning slash middle of the film is just breathtaking. It's such a such a good action set piece. Um, there's a lot. It's got a lot of nice ebb and flow to it. Um, it's very engaging throughout. Um, it just is. It's just a really well put together action sequence. And then it's also really cool too. The because uh, they're oh, what's the name of the thing that they're going for? Ooh, I can't, I can't, Coaxium? Yeah, I think it's Coaxium that they're trying to, to steal. Um, whenever they get the Coaxium off of the, like, train, and they're, like, flying with it, and the, um, I don't remember what the, the other group, they're pirates, basically, I don't remember what they're called exactly, um, are fighting for control of the container as well, and whenever Han just has to, like, let it go, and the shipment just drops, like, into the mountain, and it just, this entire, it's like, this huge explosion but it, then it like implodes on itself like almost like a black like a star just like collapsing in on itself and it's such a cool effect and like it's so cool and striking and like the thing about it is that it's a real like effect like they added so, like the the, the mountain they added some cg parts to it but the actual like explosion that you see and the shock wave and then it collapsing back in on itself they like filmed an explosion underwater and that's what like you're seeing there which is just so cool like i love whenever that's what makes visual effects so good is whenever you can accurately integrate real life and practical things with them whenever you can blend the two together seamlessly those are the best kind of visual effects that you're going to get because the realness you just can't no matter how good which they're getting insanely well i mean honestly there are some visual effects shots where like you legitimately cannot tell if it's vfx or if it's real which is just a testament to the technology at this point but like also still nothing will beat doing it for real and seeing it for real and so whenever you're able to like marry the two and bounce one off the other to just, just create this like spectacle it's just really really cool to see and so that sequence does that throughout the entire thing really but that explosion at the end is a really really um it's a really cool touch also shout out quarter crew in your vfx artist reacts videos because that is totally why i know that information about the explosion you should check out those videos if you hadn't if you haven't they're just really cool you'll learn a lot of stuff um but yeah that sequence is cool um i don't know i like it's weird. I don't have like too many thoughts on Solo. Like I just think it's a, I mean, it is uh, Donald Glover is really cool as a young Lando Calrissian. It's really cool seeing how him and Han meet. It's also really cool seeing how Han and Chewbacca meet. Um, that's really cool. It's just, it's um, a lot of things that we didn't really like need, but that are still cool to see. Like you're like, oh yeah, like that's a cool moment. And like, that's nice. Um, and like, it's just a solid movie. Like it's nothing like extraordinary. I don't think it does the it, it has kind of the western like vibe to it with han solo you know and like the smuggler and the, especially the standoff scene that we get like towards the end um it's like it does what it's trying to do well it's not like an extraordinary like masterpiece of a movie which given what it went through behind the scenes it's honestly a miracle that it's as good as it is um but yeah it's not like my favorite star wars movie but it's definitely like i really enjoy it quite a lot i think 
that and this is something i'll say about all of the the disney movies star wars has never looked as good as it looks right now like i feel like that's something that you can't really argue and like that just comes straight down to production value like just the amount of money and resources that they're able to put into these movies now like it just looks so damn good um and so that naturally is just appealing to me and just like that um not to knock the original trilogy because the original trilogy uh, except for the weird CGI that George Lucas for some reason wants to add into them after the fact like they hold up well and they look really good especially for the time and for like what they were doing and the technology and they definitely like pushed the barrier in some respects and like they hold up because of that um, I would say that the original trilogy definitely holds up from an effects standpoint better than the prequels do um, but like you, I feel like you just can't argue that the new movies just look better um, and that's just from a straight, like, visual, like, audio, just everything about them, I think, is the production value is just such high, high quality um, that I just really love that. Um, seeing the Kessel Run in 12 Parsecs is a really, really cool sequence. Um, just the, the maneuvers that Han does with the ship is nice. Um, yeah, just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good movie. I like the twist at the end where, like, you think that Han has, like, not been paying attention and didn't listen, and then it turns out he was, and you get, like, the kind of fight between Kira and uh, Voss, I think that's his name, and uh, Han, like, in the room. That's a really cool showdown. Um, it's super heartbreaking whenever Kira just, like, leaves Han. Um, and then, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Solo by now or if you somehow don't know about this, like, cameo, um, it's so hype seeing uh, Darth Maul in the movie he's like kira reports to him and like he's in hologram form and he's like the leader of um the red crimson dawn red dawn crimson does i can't remember which it's something dawn i think um man it's bad i watched this like not even a week ago and i'm, I'm struggling um but yeah that's really cool to see just i mean how can you not love seeing darth maul again you know um so yeah i think there's just overall like a lot to like about solo and uh, it's something that I definitely didn't expect because, as I said, I was very much against this film like being made in the first place. Uh, and I really like it. It's one I rank it above. Mm, uh, we'll see how like the original trilogy fares up uh, after I finish rewatching them. But I rank it definitely above episodes one and two. Um, not above episode three, but above one and two for sure. Um, so well, I think that I like it more than Return of the Jedi and A New Hope but we'll have to see. I'm like halfway through A New Hope on my rewatch. That's the other thing that's kind of like hurts me a little bit, but I'm not. Uh, Rogue One's the only, Rogue One and Revenge of the Sith are the only movies that I've watched in like one sitting on this rewatch, just because I'm watching them like when I have the time, um, which kind of hurts me a little bit as a, as a fan, but it's okay. Um, so yeah, Solo's great, I think. Um, I don't know, but I, th those are most of my thoughts on it. I mean, I don't really, prison break sequence is cool like, i mean like i said there's just, like just most of it is like solid it's a solid movie all around and like i don't i don't really think you can like complain about that um so yeah but moving on to oof, what's arguably my favorite star wars movie uh i actually struggle with picking my favorite star wars movie um my top three are the last jedi the force awakens and rogue one and um honestly all three can it's basically a toss-up for which one I like the most. Um, I just love them all. But like Rogue One, like every time I watch Rogue One, like I, kn I know how much I love Rogue One. I literally, after I saw Rogue One, I was like s on so much Star Wars hype. I was like, I need to get a Star Wars tattoo right now. And like, that's why I have the Star Wars tattoo that I have. Like I saw Rogue One and I was like, oh, I need a Star Wars tattoo. And so like I went out and like a month later got a Star Wars tattoo. Um, yeah, Rogue One is just amazing. I actually was lucky enough, uh, probably about like a month and a half after Rogue One released, um, I have like an Omnimax theater kind of close to me, which if you don't know what an Omnimax thing is, it's ba it's a dome theater, basically. They have them at like museums a lot of the time, not a lot of the time, but sometimes, I guess, I don't know. Um, but it's literally just like a dome. You just go into a dome pretty much and like you sit back and it's just a huge, like you're just inside a sphere and the movie just plays like on that and it's in and like the screen is so thin that like there's literally just like wall i mean it's one huge like gigantic wall of speakers that are just blasting straight at you 
Um, and like, it's an experience. Um, but I got to see Rogue One and Omnimax, which was so cool. Um, I'm so glad that I got to do that. Um, but yeah, like I, I know how much I love Rogue One and still every time I watch Rogue One, I'm like, damn, I love this movie so much. Like, it's just so good. Like one, Jin Erso is such an amazing character. Like just the fact, oh, Cause she goes through so much, like she goes through an extremely traumatic experience very early on. Like I love, oh dude, this movie gets me one, but then also like this movie I would say is arguably, I think it's a toss up between this and the last Jedi. We'll see how the rise of Skywalker changes things. But right now it's a toss up between this and the last Jedi for the most visually like appealing or just like beautifully shot star Wars film. Like this film is just immaculate. I'm so, so happy that Greg Frazier, the director of photography for Rogue One, is the cinematographer for the Batman. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah, I'm hyped about that. But, like, this movie, dude, it just looks so, like, every shot is just beautiful. It's just all so well done. It makes me so happy. Um, like, some, like, the opening shots are some of my favorite. Like, whenever you're going down onto, I don't remember, the, I don't know if they even mentioned the planet name um, that Galen is on whenever he's farming. Um, but just like the opening shots there of like Krennic's um, ship like flying along the beach and then like the opening shots of the fields and just it just all looks so damn good. Um, so like we get that sequence and like Jen watches her. I mean, she watches her mother get shot and then has to run and just hide in a hole and like wait for rescue. And so like she goes through that and then, you know, obviously has a very troubled like upbringing and, and life like sort of on the run and just being a criminal and, and all these different um, things that she goes through before she ends up being found by the rebellion because of who her father is, um, which also one before I get any far like further, this was the first Star Wars story film that we had, which it makes me sad that that like line of films was canceled pretty much after Solo. Like I guess now it's morphed into like Disney Plus series is what we're getting instead, which is cool. But at the same time, it was really cool seeing non Skywalker related Star Wars films in theaters that were just these like one-offs even though we only got two of them i really enjoyed both of those one of them as i'm saying is one of my favorite star wars films so it's i think it's a bummer that we didn't get more of them and that we're not going to because i don't think that we were gonna get more of them we have the ryan johnson trilogy that we know he's working on and then we have the other trilogy that D D, the showrunners behind game of thrones were attached to but no longer are attached to um, but apparently that trilogy is still happening i think uh, I mean, the trilogy is happening. I just don't know if the content will be the same still. Um, and so, like, neither of those are, like, a Star Wars story, like, one-shot, like, films. Um, so I think that it's a bummer that we're not going to get more of those. Um, it's kind of a missed opportunity, in my opinion, because I think there's a lot of, like, one-off stories that you can tell in Star Wars that, like, either don't need a Disney Plus, like, eight... I think The Mandalorian's eight episodes, like, eight hours or however many episodes it is, or, like, a trilogy that's, like six to like nine hours like i don't think that every story that you could tell in the star wars universe needs that length of time and so it's just a bummer that we're not going to get more but anyways um so this being the first one it is such a genius pitch like this movie is such a good pitch it's literally just the opening crawl of a new hope that is the story like the opening crawl of the new hope says that there was a battle the rebels spies managed to get plans to the death star and send them to a ship that's the ship that leia's on that's when Darth Vader comes in. And, like, this is just the story of how that happened. And, like, that, like, I can only imagine how Gareth Edwards, like, felt whenever he just, like, thought of that and was like, oh, that's what I want to make, like, a movie of. And, like, he was just able to pitch it. And, like, they were like, yeah, that sounds good. And then they made it. And it's one of the best Star Wars movies. And, like, that's, that's so, it's just, and it also... Not only is it such a solid pitch in the fact that it's just like the opening crawl of a new hope and it gets us to that moment which i'll get into later how excellently it weaves just right into the beginning of a new hope but also it like solves one of one one of the biggest plot holes i'm doing air quotes again of the original trilogy and like a new hope and the fact that like why would the empire build this huge gigantic battle station that has such a glaringly i mean it's not an obvious flaw but once you know that it's there a flaw that literally blows up the entire shit like battle station like why would that be there and this explains exactly why it's there like that is just so beyond genius it's i just have to like i can't appreciate that enough honestly um and so we get that um 
So yeah, Jen has to go through that and she gets recruited by the rebellion because they obviously, there was a spy, not a spy, there was a pilot that defected from the empire that's saying that Galen, that like Galen had said about the plans and he wants the rebellion to know about it so they can get the plans and destroy the Death Star. And that's like the main like um, catalyst for the film. Um, and it's just so good. Like it's, it's interesting because I remember the first couple times I watched the movie, I felt that it kind of jumped around a little bit too much, like at the beginning. Like we we get the opening sequence, I'd almost call it a prologue with Jen um, and her family, um, and seeing like her mother die and then her father get brought back into the empire. Um, and so like we get that, and then after that we skip to her being an adult, and then we go from her to Cassian, who is getting the intel about the existence of said plans or and the battle station like the death star itself um and then we go from him to i think the pilot who is being escorted by um people working for Saul Guerrero. and then we like we just keep jumping around a couple times at the beginning and, like the first couple times i watched it i was like okay this is kind of like the pacing's a little bit weird here but the pacing honestly works so well because it just establishes where these key players in the story are when the story begins like this is what everyone's doing at this point in time and we get to see how their paths converge at like i don't know probably like 30 or so minutes in 35 minutes in is when they all really um converge and then we also get our two other major players which are chirrut and um it's bays i think it's either bays or blaze i can't I can't remember which one um but we get them um at jetta as well and so it's really cool just seeing how all that kind of builds and like naturally goes together. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I don't think that the, like the jumping is, um, I, I appreciate it a lot more and have on every subsequent re rewatch of the film. Um, so it's just so good. But then, yeah, we get the Jetta sequence and like the Jetta sequence. Oh my God. One, this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where it's just really interesting seeing like a city just completely under the control of the empire like the empire is just there in full force it's because they're um excavating kyber crystals from uh, the capital and like the old jedi temples because also another great lore moment the fact that kyber crystals are what powers the death star is so cool um i think that's another awesome thing but so like they're, that's why they're on jedda and they're occupying jedda and um so yeah, it's just really, it's really something to see an entire city just completely under empirical rule and occupation. And like, there's just so many there. And then the longer that our main protagonists, Jen and Cassian, are in this city, you feel the tension rising because this is a city that it's like, obviously the people are not happy about the empire and the presence of the empire there. And like, it's just city, it's a city on the edge of just like blowing up basically, which <laughs> it does. But um it's just like the tension just constantly rises because of that. And you get this really, really great sequence in the middle where like you see some of the Saw's rebels like getting in place to ambush this group of um, stormtroopers and they do. And that whole sequence is really, really cool. It's a great action set piece. Um, it's just done well. It's a very like gritty and real. And like, that's again, the like war side of Star Wars. And like, even at this point, technically the rebellion like the war hadn't started yet the battle of scarif is the first actual battle of the rebellion according to star wars canon but like this like skirmish still is a very like gritty and real and kind of like rugged the war side of things and then also while i'm thinking about it before i get any further um i really love how this movie shows how like dirty and not easy like the rebellion is like Cassian especially you see it in his first in his introductory scene like he's meeting with another like rebel and they're getting information but the the guy has a like broken arm and whenever stormtroopers come to investigate Cassian short shoots the stormtroopers and the guy's like I can't climb out of here like what are we gonna do and Cassian's like you're right like you can't and then he's like it's gonna be okay and then he shoots him because Cassian needs to be able to get out and so like it's just the movie does a great job at showing the deeds and the lengths that people will go to for the cause like it's not clean it's not all good like the cause itself is good but the things that so many people involved have had to do in order to get to the goal that they're trying to reach is not an easy thing morally or for them just as people like it's a very hard thing to wrestle with and that comes to a head especially later on in the movie which i'll get to that scene um but yeah i just really love that the movie showed that like it's not 
I mean, like, it is still, like, good guys, bad guys. Like, obviously, the Rebellion is the good guys and the Empire is the bad guys. But it's really showing that it's not, like, that black and white. Like, it's not, like, all the good guys are, like, all good. It's not like they haven't done anything bad. It's just that they're fighting for what they believe in and doing what they need to do um, for that. And I just think that that's really cool to see. Um, but, yeah, so the the action scene on Jedi, Jedi is really cool. We end up getting... <clears throat> um, casting and Jen to Saw Gerrera and uh she sees the the message from her father and um oh man that scene that scene hits you because she's I mean she hasn't seen her father since she was a child and now she's looking at a message like from him and he's like t it's just it's so it's so emotional and she's just like oh Felicity Jones does an incredible like her performance in this film is incredible all the way through but like her emotion right there is just so so strong and just the way that once the message like finally like flickers out and shuts off and just how she just collapses it just hits you it's so powerful and while that's happening we've been getting cuts between to Krennic on the Death Star with Tarkin and they want a demonstration Tarkin wants a demonstration on the power of this battle station and so they target the capital city of Jeddah and they lay waste to this. It is annihilated. And I love how much this film showcases the just absolute destruction and power that the Death Star is. Because, I mean, in the original trilogy, like I literally I watched it yesterday in A New Hope. Whenever they destroy Alderaan, it cuts away like the planet blows up and then it cuts away so fast. Like they really skim over an entire planet being blown up and like that's a huge deal and in this film the death star is targeting like just a singular city and just the magnitude the just pure awe that the way that it's shot and the scale of the destruction that you see because you're with these characters on the ground as this happens is just it's insane and it really like it just does a brilliant job at showcasing that level of just carnage and absolute just disregard for life in general um and it's just really really powerful like you see oh you're just so up close and personal with it like from the death star you see how big the explosion reach like the debris goes into the atmosphere like it start like it loses gravity because it goes that high and just the shock wave that it sends and we have we get our heroes like having to race out of this just like the horizon is gone and now because of the way the shockwave works just the ground is like an ocean wave basically coming towards them and threatening to collapse onto them and you're just in there with that destruction and the score at that moment is just so strong and so powerful and just oh i just i can't express enough how much i love the way that they actually show the death star's power like in this film it's just it's so so good um and so yeah that sequence is just beautifully shot incredibly powerful the score is phenomenal um that's the other thing the score in this movie is top tier one of my favorite scores of all time definitely one of my favorite star wars scores michael giacchino who is also scoring the batman Woo! we're getting we've got so much quality star wars like talent working on the batman i'm so excited for that um but michael giacchino does an incredible oh i just hit my mic sorry about that um <laughs> getting too hype michael giacchino does an incredible job with the score in this movie every emotional moment hits you as hard as it should all the action the suspense the tension it's all there it's there when it needs to be and it does it so well um so yeah i love the score a lot um so yeah the jedi the jedi sequence is really really interesting um then also the um after they get like the location of galen they go to i don't can't remember the name of the planet the really the rainy and dark and like rocky planet um but that sequence is also really interesting that serves a very different narrative purpose and this is because cassian has orders to kill galen on site instead of trying to just apprehend him um because at this point it's jen's word against she just has to convince everyone because she's seen the message of her father saying that there is a like that he built a flaw into the Death Star. That's what like his attempt at redemption because he knows that the Empire would have built this without him anyway. So he made a way for them to be able to destroy it. And so she's seen this message, but no one else has. And so she just has to convince people. 
and it's easier for the rebellion to just kill Galen because obviously he's he's a scientist who's helped them build this insane weapon of mass destruction. And so it's really interesting because Cassian leaves the ship with the intention of killing Galen and then Jin leaves because she kind of like figures it out. Uh, uh, Chirrut also helps because he's um, you know attuned to the Force and he can he can tell that. Um, oh, also one of the best uh, lines in in, in Star Wars is the strongest stars have hearts of Kyber, which happens whenever Chirrut first meets Jin. Um, wow, I have something in my eye now, which is annoying. Um, oh my gosh, gosh. Good, I almost said goodness and gosh, and I said I just combined them. Um, but yeah, so that's a fantastic line. Um, but yeah, it's just really the, the whole sequence on this rocky, rainy planet. I wish I could remember the name. Um, is One, it's another visually stunning sequence, but for a completely different reason. Like It's the way that they use... Um, the darkness and then the highlight of like the lights whenever we do see them in the sequences is really really good um, but then it also just serves such a huge part of Jin's character arc because by the end of the sequence like she comes face to face with I mean she literally sees her father die like she comes one Cassian doesn't kill him which is a big character moment for him because he had direct orders to do so and he didn't do it he couldn't bring himself to do it which is really really big um, because we've seen earlier that he already doesn't really shy away from killing whenever he has to. Um, but then also we see Jen see her father die. Um, and it, it's just, it's so sad. One, I have to admit that like father death scenes in movies hit me really hard. Um, for a person, I mean, I, I didn't really, okay. But anyway, like, um, but yeah, that scene just like hits you really hard. And it's just such a, like, you see Galen's like redemption there because he's obviously, you know, like built the flaw into the Death Star. And then it's also just like, it's this sort of sense of closure for Jen and the fact that she got to see her father again. But then she's also just like holding him and he he's dead. Like he she loses him. Like she gets him back and loses him in the same moment. And it's just so heartbreaking. Um, and yeah, the the bombing run from the, the rebel fighters is... Um, is done it's just a really cool sequence to watch like it's just, you're just like yeah that's star wars um so yeah it's really good and then i mean basically from then we get like i mean they they deliberate a little bit at the rebel base on yavin 4 i believe um and like the rebel alliance basically like doesn't want to risk going for the death star plans on scarif and um then like jen is like dejected basically and Cassian like comes up and he's like, we've all done terrible things for this cause. Like, and if, oh, which during the deliberation about whether or not they should, they should go for it. Um, Jen's like, I mean, what are you going to do? Like scatter and disband? Like the, when they have a weapon that's powerful, like there's nothing that we can do. Like our only choice is to fight back. And another one of my favorite lines is like uh, every second or every moment we waste is another closer to the ashes of Jeddah. And like, Oh my God, that, what a line, what a line. Um, it's ridiculous that the rebel Alliance didn't side with her. I mean, I get it kind of from like their angle, but like, come on guys, you have to fight back. You're like, rebellions are built on hope. Come on, come on now. Um, and so, yeah, that's really interesting. That's a, a good scene. Um, but yeah, then Cassian like goes up to Jen and he's, he's just talking about how him and the bunch of the rebels that are behind him have all done terrible things for the like the cause like things that keep them up at night and he's just like i couldn't live with myself if it was all for nothing like we can't just give up we can't not fight and so this is where we get the crew for rogue one and whenever they go to leave they leave in an imperial ship that they had stolen from the planet that i can't remember the name um and whenever they're leaving the the rebel uh, i guess airspace control <laughs> is like asking what their call sign is and they say like rogue rogue one and um so that's the that's how we get the name of the ship and the film which is really really cool uh, and the crew um and so yeah then they go to scarif and this third act holy shit um i know that like everyone talks about it as if it's like one of the best things ever but that's because it is one of the best things ever like i remember seeing it in theaters the first and like the entire third act is literally like 45 or 50 minutes and it's the battle of scarif and it's just 
is pure excellence. Like it does escalation so well. There's so many different beats that it hits. Like we get them going. Okay, one, we get the first beat of them going to the planet and having to get in through the like, because there's an entire shield around this planet because this is where all the empire's like important data is. And so like the first like emotional intense beat is whenever they have to like get through that. And then they get through that and you're like, okay, like they made it to the planet. Step one, like done. And then they get onto the planet's surface and like when they all go there and like they know that this is a suicide mission <clears throat> they know more than likely there is no way that they make it out of this alive but they also know that this is the only hope that the rebellion has at actually defeating the empire and destroying the death star so they go anyway they go because they have to and like mm, that's so star wars it hurts um and so we get that and they're going and then just the speech that Jin gives before she's like, all right, like we know how this is. She's like, we'll just go out there and we'll take one chance and then we'll go to the next chance and we'll just keep going until the chances are spent. Like, and that's like, yeah, like they all know that they're, it's a pretty, like they're in an extremely dire situation and there's not much hope for any of them surviving. But like, this is the, this is what they're going to do. They're going to give their lives for this because this is so important. And that speech is so strong. And then, yeah, we get Jin and Cassian and uh, K2SO. Yeah, K2SO. Almost said C2SO, but it's definitely K2SO. Um, going to try to find the plans. And so we get cuts between that and then the rest of the rebels going and planting explosives and just overall wreaking havoc on the base at Scarif. And like, so we get the build up there whenever they're spreading out and Jen and Cassian are getting further into the complex, trying to figure out where the plans are. And then it comes to a head whenever finally like the explosions from the rebels go off and you get the beautiful shot of Krennic. Uh, the other, another thing, another beat that just ups the tension is whenever Krennic arrives on Scarif, because now you have the main villain that you've seen like in the film, um, like on Scarif. And so you're like, oh shit, like he's here now. That's really like, you know, that he, his presence is there. So that's in the back of your mind too. And so you get the awesome shot from him at like the, I don't know, it's not a watchtower, but like the uh, command station, like looking over the beach and you see just all these explosions light up the landing pads. And like, it just looks like this huge assault. And so it just kicks into full action. And like just the third act is just so good. It's all so Star Wars. We get so much great just action and suspense we get the rebels fighting on the beaches which again it just looks absolutely beautiful it's so so well shot the action here is just so well done like this is again the war side of things we're seeing that we're with the troops on the ground fighting for their lives doing what they have to do and we get that mixed with casting and Jin fighting or not fighting but sneaking their way through the complex trying to get to these death star plans and the tension just keeps raising and raising and raising the score just keeps getting more and more intense and it's just all so good it's just building on top of each other and it's just such an incredible sequence from like start to finish and it's just oh it's all so good it's all so good and then finally like the rebel alliance also gets word that like there's a rebel attack on scarif and so they send reinforcements to scarif and so then we get this one of the best space battles in star wars also starts happening where we get all these rebel fighters and tie fighters fighting in the force shield above scarif trying to like penetrate that and so we have like a space battle going on we have a ground battle going on and then we have jen and cassian sneaking trying to get these plans and like there's just these three like threads and they're just all interwoven so well and just everything builds on the other and it's just all so so good it's so star wars and it's so good and i love it so much i literally just like i hit my mic at my desk again i'm just so excited like i love this movie so much it does all of this so so well and it just continues to build and of course like oh and then the first cat like the first casualty that we feel hits whenever k2so dies because as soon as k2so dies like you knew pretty much going in that there wasn't a big chance that they were going to make it out of this alive and then also you knew that there wasn't really a chance they're going to make it out of this alive because like before this we've never heard about these characters in any of the other star wars movies so like logic dictates that they have to die here because they're not around again but like whenever k2so dies you're like oh shit this is real and then they just start dropping k2so dies and then we have cheer it who like he has to get to the like i think before cheer it cassian gets shot and he falls and we think that he might like he might be dead we're not sure um 
and so like he falls and Jen has to keep climbing to the top so she can put the plans into the thing and send it out to the rebel like fleet um so like Cassian falls and then we get Chariot who has to go to the console to activate the like beacon thing so they can just talk to the rebel alliance so that I can't remember the pilot's name um can like tell them that they need to be ready to receive the transmission and so like Chariot goes to do that and then after like he oh another one of the best lines in Star Wars I am one with the force and the force is with me I'm one with the force and the force is with me so so good he's just chanting that going to the console and he gets there turns the signal on and then an explosion just rocks him and like then you know he's dying and we see Bla Baze Malbus going towards him of course like his best friend is trying to get to him just throws all caution to the wind and just goes for him and then he's just holding Chariot in his arms as he dies and then he just goes on an all out like obviously he knows he's going to die but he's going to take out as many of these stormtroopers with him as he can and he does that and it's so good and so emotional and just so profound and then we also get the pilot like he does what he needs to do he gets the message to the rebel alliance and then a grenade flies into his ship and his ship blows up and so the main like all of these main characters are just dropping one after the other and like it's just hit after hit but they're getting closer and closer to actually being able to to achieving the goal and it just oh it's so good um and then yeah we get like the final showdown at the top with Jin and krennic and Cassian comes in and saves her and they do it they get the plans they transmit the plans to the rebel fleet and then they go back down and also while this has been happening Darth Vader shows up with the Death Star and the Death Star shows up and they just target the Scarif base and one I think it's really cool that the beam from the Death Star actually hits the top of the tower first so like Krennic gets literally the full like like the full blast of the Death Star first before the like planet does um and then like yeah the planet i mean they hit scarif and it there's cassian and jen are on the beach whenever the shock wave is coming towards them and like they know that they're dying and just cassian says like your father would be proud of you and i mean i'm tearing up now just thinking about it and like they just embrace like because they know this is it like this is the, like they've given their lives for this and it worked like they did it they saved the rebellion and it's so it's so emotional and yeah like that that final shot is so good too um yeah it's it's so good the whole the entire third act is just flawless honestly it's just it's everyone said it whenever the movie came out but like the third act alone was so worth the price of admission and like i yes 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 it's perfect um and then we get the icing on the cake which before i get to this scene i forgot to address it earlier on in the movie but we had a scene with vader earlier on we see krennic visit vader's castle which the fact that we got vader's castle in this movie is just incredibly exciting like that's such a cool part of star wars lore now and so the fact that we see that like on the big screen and in such a grand fashion it's just really really cool seeing vader like in that we see him in, even like in the back to tank before he goes to like meet Krennic and it's just so ominous and just he's such an imposing force um and then just I love how dramatic Vader is it's it's so great honestly he puts Krennic in this room and he's just on this middle of this platform which I can only imagine there, I mean there's no rails of course but I can only imagine there's just a lava pits like around him and he Vader is just like you have to meet me here and like Krennic's just standing in this ominous looking room that's just looking out over the just Mustafar which is just ash and lava and just so menacing and like he's just standing there and then like the shot whenever the door opens and you see Vader's shadow and it's literally overshadowing Krennic and then he just gets closer and the way that he just like walks through the smoke it's just oh, such a good shot too and like oh so dramatic and I love it so much um and yeah I think that scene is great his dialogue there is really cool I know some people think that they're like careful not to choke on your aspirations uh director Krennic line is like a little bit like too corny or like on the nose I think it's awesome I just think I like I don't know I feel like Vader might actually say something like that so like I like that line a lot um and that's just really cool but then we get the other Vader scene which <laughs> oh my god oh wow um was not expecting this at all uh, the first time you see the movie um and you've just gone through what I was just talking about, this huge emotion, this epic battle, um, just all of it with the Battle of Scarif. 
and then you cut to the rebels having the card that has the data plant like for the death star plans on it and they're running it to the ship and uh, vader has before this said prepare a boarding party and so you're like oh shit like is he going for this and like you see them rushing through and then their ship gets rocked and like the lights in this one corridor go out and they're just like looking and like aiming into the darkness and then you hear it you hear darth vader breathing and you're like oh fuck and then just the shot of him igniting his lightsaber oh it's so (laughs) i've again said so good a million times in this podcast episode but it's so good like the shot of him igniting his lightsaber and then just absolutely demolishing the like this scene perfectly illustrates why vader was the most feared man in the galaxy like this is why he struck fear into the minds and hearts of everyone who knew about him like this is why he was a legend and it's just so crazy it's so cool to see vader because obviously with today's technology now we can see him doing so many more things in the suit than we could in the original trilogy and with the force as well and just the way that he mixes his lightsaber skills and his use of the force and just the menace and the ferocity and just everything about the sequence is just pure oh it's like 100 percent fan service but it's so 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 perfect it's such good fan service i can't help but love it um so yeah it that like that seems crazy and then you see them trying to get the car like away from vader and they do they get it away and the ship like launches and it's the same ship that princess leia is on at the start of a new hope oh my god it's so good it literally this movie got like goes perfectly into a new hope and even like the final line they're like what have they given us like leia and she's like hope oh it's so like it just fits perfect like this movie goes seamlessly into the beginning of a new hope like it literally ends minutes before a new hope begins and that is just incredible to me that gives a new hope so much more context and just so much more umph behind it because you know like this has literally just happened this took place out like the battle of scarif was hours or like an hour before the beginning of a new hope and like that's just so so cool and then also the like message to obi-wan kenobi that we get in a new hope from leia like that was orchestrated by like general organa we see him earlier in rogue one whatever i can't remember who um one of the other rebel leaders is saying that like we need all the help we can get and he's like i have an old friend and she mentions an old jedi and he's like yeah he served me well during the clone wars like I'll send a message to him. She's like, make sure whoever you send it, you trust. And he's like, I trust her with my life, which is obviously Leia. And like, that's such a good nod to the, like, oh, just literally all of like the little fan service and the Easter eggs in this movie are just so perfect and so well done. And I just, I love, I think that this movie is so like, one, it's an incredible film just in general, but then it's just, it goes up even higher just because of how seamlessly it connects itself to the like the star wars story just in general like it is its own standalone thing but it also just fits it's just a perf it's like the perfect missing puzzle piece puzzle piece that you didn't know that you needed it's just oh, it's perfect i i love it so much rogue one is fantastic um i don't know if i have more to say on it i've talked about how beautifully it's shot how incredible the score is the all the performances from everyone are just top notch um the story is tight it's concise there's not fat on it really um the only thing that i like and still even kind of iffy about is the uh, borgullet the like monster interrogation thing i don't really know what purpose that served in the overall narrative disney i guess just want another like creepy monster looking thing but like besides that it's literally like there's no excess on the film it's a very concise story and it's just, it's incredible. The first two acts are great. So many great character moments in there. So many great themes explored in the film. And then the third act is just balls to the wall, insane, just perfect Star Wars content. Just everything about it, I love. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna, if I keep going, I'm literally just gonna keep repeating myself and rambling about how much I love this film. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Again, I'm closing in on an hour for this episode, which I think that I did pretty much what I said I was going to do. I talked for Rogue One for about like, I talked about Rogue One for like 45 minutes because I love that movie. Um, but yeah, Solo and Rogue One, the two uh, Star Wars story films that we got, the only two that we'll, we're likely to ever get. Um, I really like them. I think they're great. Um, Rogue One's one of my favorites. Solo is up there. Um, 
I'm very happy that they were both made. I think that they were a really good way to break up or to, to keep us fed in the interim between episodes seven and eight uh, all and, and nine. Yeah, between episodes seven, eight, and nine because it was Force Awakens, Rogue One, Flash Jedi, Solo. And now we're getting episode nine, which like, oh, another random tidbit thing that was so dumb of Disney, I think. And that was, I have the hiccups now, so that's cool. Um, that was making a solo release in like March when December is now Star Wars month, clearly. That was a big mistake, um, but I digress. Um, and it's also made the wait between that and like episode nine feel like it's been almost two years, basically, um, which is, oh, oh, I can't, I can't wait for the Rise of Skywalker. I can't wait. Um, but yeah, I love Solo and Rogue One. I think they're fantastic. Very happy that we have them. I think they're great additions to the overall Star Wars story. I think that they both fit very well in the time that they're in, in the overall Skywalker likes, even though they're not directly Skywalker related, they kind of are a little bit. And I just like the way that they fit in, into the overall narrative. I think it's cool. Uh, yeah, I like them a lot. Um, so I guess that's pretty much the, it, the end, the it. I was going to say it or the end. Um, I, I guess that's pretty much it for this episode. Um, as always, I'll go ahead and um, plug my social media and stuff. Um, one, before I get to my personal stuff, you should definitely follow at Comic Book Debate on Twitter. It's one of the websites that I contribute to. Um, either today or within the next couple days, I'll be having another article go up on there where I take a look at some of the biggest Batman moments of the decade in comics. Um, I had a lot of fun writing that article, so please be sure to check that out. But also just check out the website in general. There's tons of incredibly talented people that contribute to that site and make everything on there happen. A lot of great people. I'm very thankful to be a part of that family, that team. Uh, they're awesome. So be sure to follow them at Comic Book Debate and check them out at comicbookdebate.com. Um, also, be sure to follow at Comic, I think. I don't think there's an S in there. At Comic Book Case on Twitter. It's the other site that I contribute to. Again, a lot of really, really cool and great people that contribute to that side as well to have the content on there that there is. Um, so be sure to follow them. There's tons of really, really great stuff. That one's especially like very comic central. Um, and uh, I'll have I'll be contributing to another article. I don't know if I can actually talk about it uh, in detail at the moment, but I am contributing to an article that will be going up there at the end of the year. Um, so be sure to check out that Um Twitter at Comic Book Case and the website at, at Comics Book Case. Um, so be sure to follow them and check them out. Tons of great stuff on there. Um, and then, yeah, you can also follow me on Twitter if you want. Uh, my personal Twitter is at AP Batman with two T's, um, where, yeah, I just tweet about a bunch of <clears throat> random stuff, pretty much whatever's on my mind. Um, and uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Batman Files, which is uh, my Batman fan account, which um, I definitely post on more, uh, tons of Batman stuff. I'm starting to post a little bit more than just Batman. I'm still keeping it mainly like comic and pop culture focused. Of course, I'll keep my random, completely random thoughts on my personal Twitter. Um, but don't worry. The Batman content will always stay the same and increase on that account, but be sure to follow that if you don't already for more Batman stuff. Um, and then if you want, I've said this the past couple episodes cause I don't really post on there anymore, but if you want to, you can follow me at Instagram at apb.comics. Um, I may start posting again on there one day. I don't know. We'll see. Um, and yeah, be sure to leave a like rate and review on whatever you're using to listen and or watch this on. If you're on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe and turn notifications on because again, I say this at the end of every episode, but these do go live earlier than I tweet them out. These go live at like three or 4 a.m. I just don't tweet about them until later in the day. So if you wanna be amongst the first to listen and or watch, be sure to turn notifications on either on YouTube or whatever podcast platform you're using to listen. Uh, and then again, a rate and review on whatever you're using to listen and or watch would also be really cool. Really appreciate any feedback, always trying to make the podcast and the show better. So good or bad feedback, I'm here, just let me hear it. If you hated it, let me know why. If you loved it, let me know why. I'm just really interested to see what you guys think. And again, if you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening and or watching and be sure to tune in next episode. Later.